Hello, and welcome to our final news conference of ENDO 2022. Uh, we're very pleased to have you here for um, what is really exemplifies our era of really hybrid news conference. We have speakers both here in Atlanta as well as in Hong Kong. My name is Jenny Glenn Gingery, and I'm the Director of Communications and Media Relations at the Endocrine Society. Today's news conference will focus on the latest research in thyroid health. We're pleased to have with us Nikita Pozdeyev of the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora, Colorado, Dr. Chris Washington, Medical Director of Vertice Pharma in Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, and Dr. David Louis of the University of Hong Kong in Hong Kong, China, and he is joining us via video conference. Over the next 30 minutes or so, each of our speakers will present their findings and we'll end with a question and answer session. Uh, please note that we are live streaming this and there are many journalists online with us right now. And because we're broadcasting via the web, it's important for everyone to make any remarks into a microphone so they can be heard by those who are joining us virtually. Uh, for those of you who are attending online, welcome. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat window and we will get those answered once we get to the question and answer portion of today's news conference. I'd now like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Pasev, to present. Thank you, uh, Jenny, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about our work that we did in collaboration with my colleagues at the University of Washington. As you know, thyroid nodules are very common. Uh, in females above age 60, more than half of the people have thyroid nodules. It's impossible to biopsy all of them. That is why in the clinic we use risk stratification systems to decide which one are more likely to be cancerous and go for those nodules. And two most common systems are from American Thyroid Association and thyroids from American College of Radiology. And despite using the systems, we still do too many biopsies because uh, out of 100% of all the procedures we do, only about 5 to 15% are malignant which means the other 95 to 85% procedures are potentially avoidable because they produce benign results. And in our work, we try to use machine learning, which is a subset of artificial intelligence, to analyze ultrasound images from, uh, from thyroid ultrasound studies and classify thyroid nodules as benign and malignant. So this slide shows the purpose and the hypothesis of our study. Training artificial intelligence based classifier that recognizes thyroid nodules. And our primary purpose was to make uh, this classifier to correctly assign benign class to the thyroid nodules which are very unlikely to be cancerous. So that these nodules can be followed by uh, active surveillance versus doing an invasive procedure. And to make this classifier clinically relevant, we wanted to match a key performance characteristics, which is negative predictive value to that of fine needle aspiration biopsy, which is uh, our common standard of care. Finally, it was important to us to understand what are the features which are recognized by artificial intelligence to make a call, benign or malignant, and also understand uh, when the machine learning tool makes an error and incorrectly assigns benign category to the cancerous nodule. Briefly about the methods, uh, we used a, a, a machine learning method that's called deep learning. Uh, it's very commonly used for computer vision tasks, which are applications such as self-driving cars or the analysis of medical imaging. Uh, we used an approach which is commonly used to train a clinically relevant classifiers, which is called transfer learning, which means we took a model trained on the natural images, which is pictures of cars, dogs, humans, and then that model is trained on a very large image set, tens of millions of images, and then we changed it. We modified that model to uh, work on a specific task, in our case, to take ultrasound images and make a call, cancer or benign. Uh, the artificial intelligence requires a lot of data to learn from, much more than, than our human brain. That's why we collected data from 621 ultrasound studies with a known diagnosis, either by fine needle aspiration or by surgical histopathology, and tried to be inclusive, 
because it's important not to bias towards a specific subtype of thyroid cancer, most common, classic papillary thyroid cancer, because, well, this, this, the model would, would learn to recognize that specific subtype very well and perform well on that subset of thyroid nodules. It would not be clinically relevant because we encounter all sorts of types uh, of malignant lesions in the thyroid. That is why we included uh, a difficult to classify subtypes such as follicular thyroid cancer and even non-thyroidal malignancies which sometimes end up with metastasis within the thyroid. It's important not just to train the classifier but also to test it independently on a separate data set which is an ultimate indication of how that machine learning tool performs. That's why while our training data set was collected by the University of Washington, we went to a different healthcare system, University of Colorado, and collected data for 145 nodules, which we didn't touch at the stage of model training, but then did an ultimate test of how well it performs uh, when we decided that the model performs well enough on our training validation data set. Finally, to make our data set much larger than we would be able to do otherwise, we leveraged heavily uh, video data stored in an ultrasound scene eclipse. That's why, while we only have 621 cases, we actually trained the model on almost 70,000 individual images which we extracted from the video clips. So this, this slide shows performance of this classifier. There are two ways you can test it. One is using an approach that's called cross-validation. That's when you take your training data set and split it into five chunks. You, take, you use four chunks to, uh, to make the model learn, the artificial intelligence learn, and you use fifth chunk to test how well it performs. And then you premiere this five times using each time different chunk. That's called five-fold cross-validation. And with this, with this method, we achieved area and the receiver operating characteristic curve of about 0.89. Uh, and then you could select a, a threshold to convert um, a continuous output from the model, which is probably your malignancy, to a binary classifier, final call, benign, not benign. And this, the threshold that we selected is shown here with a, a green vertical and horizontal line, and we on purpose selected it so that the sensitivity and negative predictive value of the model is high. It's compatible to uh, fine needle aspiration biopsy, and we achieved sensitivity of 94% and negative predictive value of 96% on five-fold cross-validation. It's important to see what the specificity is, because if, if the threshold is too aggressive, you basically just recommend biopsy for every single nodule. And in our case, we achieved specificity of 52%, which is, which is reasonable. It, it would, that means that the model would would allow us to defer uh, invasive procedure for a significant number of nodules. And finally, the ultimate test of performance is on an independent image set, which has not been touched during the training stage. And that produced compatible performance with a sensitivity of 97%, negative predictive value of 98.5%, and we got the specificity of 61% on, on, a, on a test data set. And in fact, uh, there was only one uh, malignancy which was incorrectly classified, which turns out to be minimally invasive follicular thyroid cancer, which is considered an indolent cancer in the most of the cases. Now, as I mentioned, it's important to understand how this works because uh, many of these AI-based models are criticized for being a black box. You just feed the images and it does some magic inside and gives you the output. You don't know how, it's difficult to trust it. So that's why we used um, an algorithm that's called GradCam to actually see what are the salient images, salient part of the image, which is shown here on the heat map. This is what the, the computer considers important when it makes a call, cancer or not cancer. And then we looked at the nodules which were classified with a high confidence. So probability of malignancy close to 100%, as you see here at the top number on top. And we found that uh, a very high suspicion nodules, which are hypoechoic with microcalcifications, are uh, recognized with a great confidence by the uh, computer model, which makes that decision based on 
based on the most important, most suspicious part of the image as shown here on a heat map. Uh, because we put an emphasis on a negative predictive value, it's more important was, for us it was more important to understand what are the benign features, how it makes a confident call of what's not cancerous. And it turns out that most of the nodules which have very low probability of malignancy, close to zero, they are actually spongiform nodules with, with microcystic spaces, uh, which we also use as uh, a benign feature in our existing clinical risk certification systems. False negative calls, this is the most important part where the computer makes an error. And we found that most of, most of the false positive calls actually belong to, to the difficult to classify subtypes of cancer, such as follicular thyroid cancer or follicular variant of papillary thyroid cancer. Uh, there were two mistakes ma made on non-thyroidal malignancies. One is thyroid lymphoma, which is shown here, and one is metastasis from chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which, as you see, looks like a pretty benign spongiform nodule otherwise. And, and most of these nodules, they didn't have any overt suspicious characteristics like, like these guys here on top, uh, which means that the artificial intelligence classifier has the same struggles as human providers. We, we have difficulty uh, recognizing um, cancers such as follicular thyroid cancer because they just don't, don't look suspicious on the imaging. They look pretty, pretty benign. Um, so I guess the most important question is, is it clinically relevant? And what would be the use of it? Because we, we obviously can train uh, a radiologist recognize spongiform nodules. Uh, and I think there are two benefits from, uh, from using uh, such a system in clinical practice. First, there is no question of inter observer variability. The, the, the benefit from the computer and its weakness at the same time is that it's consistent. You give it the same image, it will produce you the same output each time. And it only needs to be trained once and then it will perform for as long as you use it. The second benefit, we actually are not that good in recognizing spongiform nodules. There was a great Meet the Professor session yesterday where that challenge was presented. And we, while I don't have it on the slide, we looked at uh, practice patterns in the large healthcare system and found that we have obviously too many of those spongiform nodules because radiologists tend to overcall suspicious features uh, using TARAT's algorithm in, in that particular case. And that's where the computer, which is objective and predictable, could help and identify those very low suspicious nodules and say, don't biopsy them. They are so unlikely to be cancerous that it's okay to watch them. And, and finally, we found that AI, in quotes, thinks similar to humans. It recognizes the same, same features on the images, which we would consider suspicious, not surprisingly. Uh, and with this, I want to finish, and thank you very much for your interest in this work, and I'll be happy to answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pazdayev. Uh, now we're going to have uh, Dr. Washington present. So hello, I'm Chris Washington, Medical Director with Vertice Pharma. I'd like to thank Indo Society for inviting me to pre present today and for having an interest in this great work. On behalf of my colleagues, I'd like to uh, share with you some exciting data uh, around a study entitled The Comparable Bioavailability of a Novel Levothyroxine Solution When Administered with Coffee. So you're likely aware that levothyroxine is the recommended uh, treatment of choice for hypothyroidism. It's one of the most widely prescribed drugs worldwide, um, typically depending on the ranking that you're looking at in the top five. However, the absorption of levothyroxine may be affected by many foods, uh, coffee, as well as a variety of medications. As such, current guidelines, uh, both in the US and internationally, recommend administration on an empty stomach 
at least 30 minutes before breakfast to avoid any interactions that could reduce the intestinal absorption. However, since coffee particularly um, is an important part of um, many farm morning routine, um, and based on the National Coffee Association's uh, latest 2022 trends, about 65%, or greater than 65% of uh, Americans drink coffee every day, with greater than 80% of that being at breakfast. So as you can imagine, um, trying to find that right uh, schedule um, to uh, take medications as well as uh, get through your morning routine can be a challenge. This is especially uh, significant for patient populations that require a very um, narrow treatment target, such as those that are elderly, um, pregnancy, and in some pediatric patients. Um, there is evidence that liquid formulations that bypass the gastric dissolution phase of absorption may mitigate the interference seen with levothyroxine and some of these foods in coffee. Um, Thyquidity, which is marketed by Vertice Pharma, is an oral solution of levothyroxine. It's been shown uh, to be bioequivalent to Synthroid under fasting conditions. And its formulation is designed to offer individualized dosing flexibility for those uh, requiring supplementation for hypothyroidism. So the current study was undertaken to evaluate whether levothyroxine, specifically thyquidity, um, when consumed with coffee, would affect the bioavailability or systemic availability. So this study was designed as a single center open label, single dose, two-period crossover study, whereby 40 healthy adult volunteers, both male and female, uh, with an average age of about 30, uh, BMIs were in the mid-20s, um, and they had no significant medical illnesses or received any medications uh, that were known to interfere with levothyroxine. After a 10-hour fast, uh, these participants were randomized to one of two treatments. Uh, so the first was a 600 microgram dose administered as 30 mils of thyquidity. Uh, again, the concentration is 100 micrograms per five mils. And in the first treatment group, they were uh, administered with an eight ounce uh, cup of water under fasting conditions, so uh, normal recommendations. Uh, in the second treatment group, they received the same single 600 microgram dose by way of thyquidity, and they uh, received their medication with uh, water. However, they were allowed to have uh, an eight ounce cup of American coffee with no milk or sweeteners uh, within five minutes of that dose. After the first treatment period and a 40 day washout, they were crossed over and uh, each group then received the uh, opposite treatment for period two. Blood samples were assessed for T4, both browns and free and uh, they were uh, then assessed over 48 hours, I'm sorry. So here you'll find the results. Um, in, on the left, you'll find the mean serum T4 concentrations over time for 40 participants. Each of the 40 participants completed the study. Uh, the dotted line represents for you those that receive their levothyroxine under fasting conditions, and the uh, solid line uh, received it uh, followed within five minutes by coffee. And you note there those lines are, are very close, uh, demonstrating comparable bioavailability. Additionally, the PK parameters, uh, specifically the AUC uh, and the Cmax, were comparable for both groups and that's depicted here for you in this table. What's important here is uh, the geometric least square means ratio. So what you see in the yellow font here, um, for Cmax it was 96%, for AUC 94%, and uh, additionally the 90% confidence intervals as well fall into uh, the mid to high 90s, um, which, which tells us that um, this, these numbers or ratios fall within the FDA's acceptance range of 80 to 125 percent, demonstrating an absence of a food effect on bioavailability. There was 
uh, one adverse event that occurred. It was defined as uh, blood glucose that was decreased. It was uh, classified by the investigator as mild in severity and unlikely related to the treatment, and it resolved without any further action or sequelae. There were no deaths, serious adverse events, or discontinuations due to adverse events, and there were no clinically significant findings for vitals, uh, which is important to note with a drug like levothyroxine in healthy volunteers, as well as no significant changes in the ECG or electrocardiography. I'd also like to take the opportunity to share with you an additional study that was conducted. Uh, this particular analysis compared the bioavailability of uh, the same uh, levothyroxine oral solution. And uh, what was evaluated here was administration uh, when the product was taken within 10 minutes or 30 minutes of a high fat, high calorie breakfast. If you recall, I mentioned in the introduction that there are a number of foods um, that can also interact with levothyroxine and may potentially alter the absorption profile. So this, in similar fashion, was a single center, open label, randomized, two period, two sequence crossover study, very similar to our, uh, design as the previous coffee study. And here they compared the bioavailability of uh, the levothyroxine oral solution, again, administered either 10 or 30 minutes prior to this high calorie, high fat meal. The uh, participants were both male and female. Again, the uh, characteristics of the population were very similar to the previous analysis in that they were, um, on average, about 30 years old. Their BMIs were in the mid-20s, uh, and they had no clinically significant medical illnesses or received any medications, uh, both uh, prescription or over-the-counter, that were known to interfere with their levothyroxine. In this analysis, after a 10-hour fast, they were randomized to the one or two groups. Uh, after a 600 single microgram dose of levothyroxine by way of the thyquidity uh, oral solution, they were uh, randomized to either a 30 minute uh, wait period, so received the dose, and then in 30 minutes uh, they received or, or were allowed to uh, consume uh, this 950 calorie standardized breakfast, um, or in the uh, second cohort they were administer this high fat, high fat, high calorie standardized breakfast at uh, the 10 minute time point. So here you'll find the results for this second analysis and similarly the mean serum T4 concentrations over time were comparable uh, in similar fashion. The geometrically square mean which is the uh, parameter that the uh, regulatory agent, agency is interested in in terms of establishing uh, bioavailability <clears throat> met the acceptance range of 80 to 125 percent, uh, again establishing lack of a food effect on bioavailability. There were four adverse events reported in three subjects. Each of them were isolated lab abnormalities without clinical symptoms. The uh, investigator classified each of them as mild in severity, and three of the four were uh, classified as possibly related to uh, the study treatment. Uh, one was um, not related to the study treatment, specifically the, the, the platelet adverse event was not related to the study treatment, and three of the four adverse events were normal on repeat testing. There were no death, serious adverse events, or discontinuations uh, due to adverse events reported, and again, no clinically significant findings on vitals or ECG. So in summary, these studies have demonstrated that there was similar bioavailability when uh, this levothyroxine oral solution marketed as thyquidity is administered in healthy adult volunteers prior to coffee uh, or under fasting conditions or when administered within 10 minutes uh, or 30 minutes of a high fat, high calorie standardized breakfast. Again, this means um, that there was no food effect when uh, this formulation was taken within uh, the five minutes of coffee or 10 minutes of uh, this 950 calorie breakfast. It is important to note um, that uh, while these, these findings are exciting um, and encouraging that we do um, want you to continue for providers to continue to follow the current FDA approved label for thyquidity, um, recommending that it be taken on an empty stomach 30 to 60 minutes prior to breakfast um, and that patients should continue to follow all other label instructions. 
So with that, I thank you for your time and I will answer any questions at the designated time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Washington. Um, and now I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Louis. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Louis, a clinical assistant professor from the Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism, Department of Medicine, School of Clinical Medicine, the Kashing Faculty of Medicine, the University of Hong Kong. It's my pleasure to share with you all the results from our study, which is a joint collaborative effort between my team from the Department of Medicine and Professor Ian Wong's team from the Department of Pharmacology and Pharmacy, both from the University of Hong Kong. So the topic of this study is the safety of inactivated and mRNA COVID-19 vaccination among patients treated for hypothyroidism, a population-based cohort study. So here are the disclosures. So this study is funded by research grant from the Food and Health Bureau, the government of the Hong Kong SAR. And this study represents part of the studies from the COVID-19 Vaccines Adverse Events Response and Evaluation Program, the CARE program, where you can find details from the link below. So what has our study shown? So inactivated and mRNA COVID-19 vaccines did not cause significant fluctuations in thyroid function or increase in adverse events among patients treated for hypothyroidism. So why did we carry out this study? The thyroid gland is actually a potential target of attack by SARS-CoV-2. Studies have found the expression of angiotensin converting enzyme 2, the ACE2, the entry receptor for SARS-CoV-2 expressed in the thyroid cells. And there were actually also cases of subacute thyroiditis and Graves' disease described among COVID-19 patients. So therefore, there are also similar concerns raised regarding the potential of COVID-19 vaccination in inducing thyroid dysfunction. So including, there are case reports of subacute thyroiditis and Graves' disease after COVID-19 vaccination. So up till the time of January 2022, there, there has been already 80, more than 80 cases of uh, such a thyroid dysfunction after vaccination reported. Including one of our reports, we reported a patient who developed Graves' disease after COVID vaccines on the background of eight-year history of hypothyroidism or unlethal thyroxine. Moreover, it's actually the first time any mRNA vaccine has been approved for human use widely. And hypothyroidism may be associated with worse prognosis in COVID-19 patients, where the possible roles of thyroid hormones in the immune system may explain this relationship. And hypothyroid patients, secondary to radioactive iodine or thyroidectomy to an extent less than total thyroidectomy may still have viable thyroid tissue and therefore these patients are still at risk of thyroid-specific outcomes after COVID-19 vaccination. So in Hong Kong, there are two authorized COVID-19 vaccines, the CoronaVac, the inactivated whole virus vaccine, and BNT162B2, the mRNA vaccine. So we therefore carried out this population-based cohort study in order to systematically evaluate whether COVID-19 vaccines are associated with increased risk of adverse events focusing on this at-risk group of patients treated for hypothyroidism. So this study is actually a propensity score-weighted, retrospective, population-based cohort study. And this cohort actually makes use of a population-wide electronic medical records of the Hong Kong Hospital Authority. And that's also linked to the population-wide COVID-19 vaccination records from the Department of Health, which provides data including demographic the demographics, medical comorbidities, and also the vaccination records. And this vaccine safety data linkage has been used to conduct population-based pharmacovigilance studies of COVID-19 vaccines on Bell's palsy, arthritis flare-up, myo or pericarditis, and whether patients with various diseases are at high risk of experiencing adverse events. So in this study, we included adult levothyroxine users continuously for at least three months at a time index date 
between 23rd February 2021 and 9th September 2021. And the index date was defined for vaccine recipients as the dose of uh, date of the first dose vaccination. While for unvaccinated individuals, we assigned a pseudo index date to match uh, that of the vaccine recipients. The study excluded patients who were on antiviral agents in the three months before index date because these represent patients with thyroid toxic poses requiring treatment. We also excluded patients with thyroid cancer because they require thyroid hormone suppressive therapy with different TSH level targets. We follow up these patients from the index date till the occurrence of outcome, death or end of study, whichever came first. So here are the study outcomes. Primarily, we looked at the thyroid specific outcomes. So dosage reduction in levothyroxine implied a state of thyroid hormone excess, while dosage escalation in levothyroxine implied a hypothyroid state. And secondary outcomes included emergency department visits, unscheduled hospitalization in 21 days after index date, adverse events of special interests, and also all cause mortality. So here are the baseline characteristics. So among 4 million records from the linked database, we identified 47,000 levothyroxine users. So among them, 23,000 of them were unvaccinated, while 12,000 of them received BNT162 B2, and 11,000 of them received Cornovac. We can see from the baseline characteristics that those unvaccinated individuals tend to be older and also tended to have more medical comorbidities as indicated by the Charleston Comorbidity Index. Nonetheless, as per the sign of our study, all baseline characteristics were balanced using a propensity score weighting method among the three groups as indicated by the, um, um, after weighting, the ASMD were balanced. So the results of the study were shown here. So COVID-19 vaccination was not associated with increased risk of dosage reduction in LT4, dosage escalation in LT4, emergency department visits, or unscheduled hospitalization, as indicated by the adjusted hazard ratios and also the respective 95% confidence intervals. With regard to the number of deaths, there were two in the BNT162B2 group versus one in the CoronaVac group. While for the adverse events of special interest, there were six in the BNT162B2 versus three in the CoronaVac group. Again, they are comparable. So these AESI would include examples like Bell's palsy. Moreover, we performed sensitivity analyses to look for any differential impact of COVID-19 vaccination on the adverse outcomes. So we actually stratified the population according to age, sex, and also pre-vaccination thyroid status as indicated by TSH level. And these analyses were largely consistent with the main analysis. So the implications from our study is that uh, both inactivated and mRNA COVID vaccination are not associated with unstable thyroid status or increased risk of adverse outcomes among patients treated for hypothyroidism. And hence, these reassuring data should encourage them to get vaccinated against COVID-19 for protecting them from potentially worse COVID-19 related outcomes. So in fact, the results of our study has been published in thyroid where you can see the details in the link below. And we uh, have also performed related work uh, with regard to COVID vaccines and thyroid, which is actually also submitted as a late breaking abstract in this end of 2022. So uh, we evaluated the impact of COVID-19 vaccines on thyroid function and autoimmunity, and also evaluated the potential influence of pre-existing thyroid autoimmunity on the neutralizing antibody responses. We showed that uh, COVID-19 vaccination was not associated with clinically significant thyroid dysfunction, despite a modest increase in antithyroid antibody t -tests. And secondly, neutralizing antibody responses were not influenced by pre-existing thyroid autoimmunity. And the results of our work has just been accepted for publication in the Journal of Endo Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, the Endocrine Society Journal. Again, you can see the details through the link below. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Louis. We really appreciate you joining us, particularly when it's so late where you are. Um, if everyone, uh, we're now going to open up the question and answer period. Um, Colleen is out in the audience with the microphone. If you have a question, if you're in the room, uh, if you're online, please make sure to type in the chat window and we'll get to you. Hi, Miriam Tucker with Medscape. Um, Dr. Washington, are there any data on patient compliance with that 30 to 60 minute wait? Because it seems like a no brainer to try and get rid of that requirement in whatever way possible. because she's spoken in the microphone. Sure. Okay. Hi, thanks for that question. Um, so right now, the data that I've shared is, is uh, the first logical step in, in evaluating um, a new potential uh, administration option. Um, at the, to date, we do not have any, any compliance data. Uh, but, you know, it's encouraging what we've seen today. So we'll continue to explore. <coughs> Any other questions in the room from anyone? Uh, Dr. Liu, we have one question uh, for you. So would you advise people with thyroid issues to get the COVID vaccine based on your findings? So uh, thank you for your question. So based on our findings, uh, actually we are studying patients with uh, treated for hypothyroidism. So once they are stable, they're actually uh, fit for uh, receiving a COVID-19 vaccination. Okay, great, thank you so much. Um, and then one more question for Dr. Pazdiev. Um, how common is it to use AI or deep learning in uh, thyroid, thyroid nodule detection? Isn't the technology expensive? It's not common. Uh, there are a couple of FDA approved tools which mostly designed for radiologists to help with a throughput when they uh, read ultrasound images. I, I don't know what's the cost of it. It's definitely not, not the common practice yet. Um, when we start using it more frequently, and if we start, I think the answer is definitely we will. Uh, we already are using machine learning in endocrinology. One of the examples is a FROX tool when we decide for uh, whether to prescribe osteoporosis medication, mm -hmm. not so much in thyroid, but it's coming. It, it will become more prevalent as we develop those tools and they become more commonly accepted. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Washington, uh, one question about your findings. How do you think that your study um, will help patients and potentially improve their quality of life? So again, this, this is our first um, evaluation of, of the uh, reduced wait time requirements. Um, we do see that it potentially may offer uh, more dosing flexibility for patients with hypothyroidism. Great, thank you so much. I think those are all the questions that we have. Great. Well, thank you again to everyone who joined us today. We're so grateful that you were able to be here for this interesting discussion. As a reminder, recordings of today's event will be available in the coming days on our YouTube channel, the Endocrine Society's YouTube channel, as well as our website. If you have additional questions or would like to set up an interview with one of the presenters, please contact our team at media at endocrine.org. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day at Endo 2022.